The scene I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Bruce Cook with BP and Rob Corrado from Columbia. So we'll be hosting the session today. So I want to welcome everybody to Catalysis for Petrochemicals One here in the French Room. So hopefully this is in your destination uh, for the day. Otherwise, I'll have to buy another flight. So we have a very full schedule today, and I want to make sure that we have time for the speakers to give their uh, their full talks and to share their thoughts with us. We do also do the speakers value discussion, so I ask all the speakers to try to stay on time and allow some time for questions at the end because I know a lot of people value that discussion time as much often as the actual the actual talk. So as everybody finds your, uh, there's things I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today, which is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bricker from UOP, director uh, at UOP. Uh, contribution and the title for his talk is Advances in Industrial Petrochemical Catalysis. So, with no further ado, I turn it over to Jeff. Thank you. Uh, the mic on? Can you hear me okay? In the back? Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for the North American meeting for inviting me to give a talk and uh, happy to share these results in uh, petrochemicals with you. First, I'll uh, just start with a, a first take slide, and that is petrochemical demand, we're really seeing it soar into the future. It's just taking off, and uh, that's really being driven by a growth of middle class in, in the BRIC countries, emerging regions. There's something on the order of 800 million people around the world that are moving into the middle class. And when people move into the middle class, they like to purchase things or buy things that are you know, derivatives of propylene, of olefins, and the PET, paraxylene, and the PET chain. That's really the basic driver worldwide for the petrochemical growth. And we're going to see an unprecedented growth in light olefin shown here over the next 10 years, and paraxylene taking off as well. It's really not stopped growing from a very large base production. And so we're going to see additional need for on-purpose propylene I'm going to talk about today at most of the talk. And then the demand for Paris Island is basically going to double over the next 30 or over the next 10 years from about 30 million tons. So a very large base already doubling very quickly. And this, uh, this capacity is being put in worldwide, as I'll show you in a little while. Uh, the outline for my talk is, well, where is this olefin growth going to come from? And we're really seeing a step change in olefin production technologies worldwide. And I'll go into that. And what are the market drivers for that? I'll talk about dehydrogenation on purpose. That's growing very fast, especially uh, North America, China, Middle East. Uh, the scientific part of the talk is going to be on the catalyst design. I'm really going to talk about work done with, uh, by our UOP scientists on platinum cluster chemistry. That's the scientific part of the talk. And what do these small clusters below 20 uh, angstroms look like? There's been a lot of studies on platinum metal particles. Excellent work done. We're going to look at the lowest end, how clusters form, and what structure do they have. And it actually, it's very interesting, and uh, not what I would call my, what I expected to see when we look at these. And I, if I have time, I'll talk about MTO, because that, again, is a, a new emerging technology that's taking old, over olefin production. First, very quickly, I won't spend a lot of time on the introduction. A big change is the shale gas hydrocarbons, especially in North America, that's going to happen worldwide. Those are these hydrocarbons in the gas-rich shale, very deep. You probably read about it in the newspapers. You may be involved in it if, if you're working with production companies. It's going to change the world. It's already changed North America petrochemicals tremendously. I'll just show you, this is a world map, and in the red is where there are significant shale gas reserves have been found. In the gray regions, they haven't really looked. It wasn't part of the study. And our conclusion basically is anywhere anyone's looked, they found shale gas. And it's going to be produced you know, heavily, not only in North America, but in the future in China and other regions. In North America, you can look out, and there are various project projections. And the interesting part about shale gas isn't necessarily the natural gas, although that's good for energy prices. It's the wet gas liquids. And there's going to be a lot of supply of wet gas liquids, meaning ethane and higher, ethane, propane, butanes, and so on. And that's already, as many of you know, has shifted to steam crackers all over to ethane in North America. So that shift to crackers from naphtha or gas oil to ethane, of course, has led to uh, an increasing propylene gap. We knew there was going to be a propylene gap, 
and a demand for on-purpose propane dehydro. That was known. But this gap is accelerating because of the shale gas, the emergence of shale gas liquids, um, especially cheap available ethane across North America. So what are the olefin technologies? The emerging ones really are the top two. Uh, they're taking up a lot of the propylene um, uh, demand. That is on purpose. You have very inexpensive propane from shale gas. And you have the largest differentials that you can imagine between feedstock and product price. You know, propylene may be over $1,000 a ton. You may have differentials in some regions as high as $600 a ton between propane and propylene. And so this is unprecedented in petrochemicals, really. And that makes it on purpose popular. Also, very cheap coal in China, available coal to make syngas, to make olefins from MTO. So UOP's license, I think we announced four MTO plants so far, and there are many more by other entities in China and across the world that you'll, you'll hear about. The conventional ways, of course, uh, a lot of steam cracking going in from methane, as I mentioned, and then a decrease in the amount of naphtha and gas oil cracking, which, of course, not only causes a propylene gap, but it causes a future butadiene shortage. Butadiene prices are soaring, and other sea olefins and other pie gas, C5 diolefins, and so on. Today I'm going to focus on making uh, light olefins, the light olefins that are growing fast. So propane dehydro and MTO have taken off, literally, and they're taking up a lot of the slack uh, in production uh, for those olefins. Now, why do propane dehydro? I mentioned a little bit about this, but basically you have very inexpensive C3 LPG now available. It's one feed, one product, very high yields, and very fast payback because of the differential feed and product, basically. So it's a one feed, one product uh, technology. And just looking at UOP, uh, we had um, we introduced this technology actually a long time ago in, in the early 90s. In the first plant was actually in Thailand, and uh, but it's taken off recently. We have nine operating units, also for C4. But in the last 18 months, just to give you an idea of the growth of this area, there's been 13 plants announced just for Olaplex. And that's adding over 8 million tons of capacity of propylene. So those are in North America, China, Middle East. So we don't really see a stop to this because of the, this uh, shale gas situation and the shifting of feedstock availability. And uh, so what I want to talk about then is the technology for light paraffin dehydrogenation. I'll start with the process because the process really drives what the catalyst is and the catalytic chemistry. And the characteristics of the light paraffin dehydro, we're talking about very high temperatures, 600 degrees Celsius, over that, low pressure, highly endothermic, 30 kcals per mole. And as you dry propane conversion higher, you make propylene and then propadiene and methyl acetylene, and those coke very rapidly at 640 degrees C. And so the reactor design is very important, and, and catalyst design. But in all the systems, basically, the catalyst life becomes short could be days for our technology to hours for other, other technologies out there. And as in all catalytic process, uh, you really can't separate the catalyst from the process. These conditions are, are very severe, uh, high temperature conditions, coping conditions, so the catalyst design is based on that. The process, I won't go through it in detail other than to say it's a multi-reactor process with interbed heating. It uses uh, what we call CCR, which, which many of you know, but it's continuous catalyst regeneration. So the catalyst is spherical, and it's moving continuously from the reactor to the regenerator. So it's moving from 600 C, reducing conditions, to carbon burn, oxidation conditions continuously. So there's a complex system of lock hoppers and so on to keep the oxidizing and reducing conditions separate. But it can run continuously. And the beauty of this system is you can change catalysts on the fly, so there's no downtime. We've been we've built over 200 of these for platforming, and now uh, the amounts I've shown for, for dehydro for propane. For C4 units, you only need three reactors because equilibrium is easier. Sorry, I'll go back one. Can I go backwards? Yeah, and this just shows the complexity of the reactor design. So you have these catalyst pills continuously moving from a regenerator through the reactor, and it's in 
in to out radio flow reactor through that catalyst bed. So there's a lot of mechanical engineering, complex design um, for a high temperature operation of 640 type temperature. I'll go on. As I said, we introduced the first units a long time ago, actually, and then we've made continuous improvements. We're now in the seventh generation of catalyst. It's called DH18. It has 15% more throughput than the previous. And that's needed because these plants are becoming very large. I think about two weeks ago we announced a licensing to Ascend Petrochemicals, a one million ton plant. So these plants started very small. Like I think the first plant was maybe 200, 180,000 tons. Now they're million ton plant designs. So you can imagine with a moving bed system, regenerator, these are becoming fairly complicated. And the catalyst has to keep up with that. So we've been able to make increasingly improved catalyst. And uh, what I want to talk about today then is the, the catalysis around that and especially the platinum function. And so it's a very simple reaction. It's not like platforming or some of these complex reactions, hydrocracking that we work on. It's pretty simple. You take the paraffin, you make an olefin, you make dyne, and you make coke. When you get into heavier paraffin dehydrogenation, it's much more complicated because of aromatic formation. But for, for this system, we're just looking at a for a good catalyst, this is the reactions we're talking about. Of course, you removed all the acidity from the catalyst, and you properly modified the platinum so you don't get a lot of side reactions like fracking. Catalyst design, uh, as I mentioned, long, what do the customers want? Long life, five years, hundreds of cycles, same conversion and selectivity. Our catalyst is virtually 100% selective at this stage. The only side reactions that really occur are thermal reactions and the heaters and so on. Resistance to feedstock and regenerator upsets, which you might see, well, that seems like a, just a practical thing, but that, that can happen all the time if you talk about there's always earthquakes or power outages in some of these regions we build these plants, and so the plants have to be robust. And lowest metal investment. So for the, the more science-oriented part of this talk, I'm going to talk mostly about the platinum cluster function. Because I think there's some things that I didn't expect to see. I, I don't think we fully understand those. I mean, in the past, I talked last fall about metal and its support modifiers, and I'll just touch on those in this talk. So what are our methodologies we use? We use the, uh, a, a commercial level of platinum, 0.35 weight percent platinum on a gamma alumina from a chloride-containing precursor. And that is treated at 525 to oxidize it, and then we do reduction and study the platinum cluster growth. We used XAFs. We used our uh, new aberration corrective stem, which is a wonderful, I know many of you are getting this tool. It's expensive, but it's indispensable, we, as I'll show. And uh, we use those in, com uh, in combination with other techniques. The team that worked on this uh, is a combination of people from the national labs, which we work very effectively with at Oak Ridge and the beam lines. And also UOP team of uh, many people you know, Steve, Simon, Shelley, Sergio, and Morton from UOP. So I'm going to be talking about the studies they've done. And, you know, I've made this is obvious for this audience, so I'll go quickly. But, you know, XS measures the average coordination number, and you can get chemical information, of course, and, and nearest neighbors and what the structure looks like. But with our new stem, we can see the association of platinum atoms with modifier atoms. We can see every atom in real catalysts. So I won't be talking about model catalysts or flat alumina surfaces. These are real catalysts, commercially, catal commercially prepared catalysts, laboratory prepared catalysts. So the combination, we think, is useful. The AC stem, this is for a hydrothermally treated platinum on gamma alumina at 0.35 weight percent. I just want to give you an idea of what we can see. So here we're intentionally agglomerating the platinum. I just wanted to give you a quick view. We can see individual atoms quite easily now with this microscope. We can see clusters. I'll show you later we can count the exact number of atoms in every cluster that we can see. We can do that in several ways, but when there's overlap of atoms, you can, you can intentionally damage the cluster and spread the atoms out and count them. That becomes important later. I'll show you about that. So we're using this to monitor what's occurring in our process units and in catalyst design. So I'll start with uh, uh, how, what happens when we start as an as-received catalyst. And what I mean by as-received is from a platinum chloride pre precursor calcined to 525C. What we see 
is on a fresh catalyst, mostly isolated platinum atoms. And this is just showing the excess coordination number here, bonded to both oxygen and chloride. This is consistent with literature uh, publications. The stem in images in the XFs agree completely. There are a few dimers, um, but mostly single atoms. And that's something we know. We've known for a long time. Well, we have, weren't able to observe it for a long time, but chemiabsorption, we believe for a long time we have very well dispersed catalysts in the oxychloride fresh state. What happens is when you start reducing these catalysts? Well, at low temperature, the first thing you obviously see is reduction in ligand loss. So you start reducing the oxide, start removing chloride, and the white uh, line area, area decreases significantly very quickly, and you get reduced platinum species. At the high temperature, I'll go more into detail on this, but you see platinum cluster and then support platinum interactions. I'll go into detail on that. It's been nice work by Konigsberger and others in this field. So the strong exitic white line is decreasing by 250 degrees C. We have a highly reduced catalyst. And there's sub subtle, just subtle changes in the zanes at high temperature. And I'll go into more detail. For the low temperature regime, what we see is the initial reduction. The, we can see the platinum oxide and chloride bonding changing. And we can start to see platinum platinum cluster formation by 250 degrees C, but these are very small clusters with just a few atoms in it. And I'll show you the stem picture next. So you can see incipient clusters. You can see still see isolated platinum at 250 C. You can see over here the average coordination number for the platinum by XAFs. And the clusters are really small. They're four to six atoms. So I don't even know if I call them a cluster like an organometallic chemist would, would make a carbonyl cluster. But they're small atoms associated with one another. And the XAFs and the stem images agree almost completely at low temperature. When we go to higher temperature, it gets much more complicated. And, and I don't think it's necessarily expected, at least I did, as a catalyst scientist, I didn't necessarily expect to see what we saw. And that is we see uh, increased platinum oxide signal. Uh, I'll show more interpretation of the data later. And what I'm showing here is the symbol data in the, on our line model for our XS model. And the platinum-platinum decreases above 400. So the platinum-platinum interactions actually decrease as you go from 400 to 700 C. Now you may say 700 C, that seems like not a practical temperature, but remember for dehydrogenation, we're talking about temperatures approaching that. So 700 C is sort of an upper bound of what you might see after prolonged high temperature reduction with these kind of catalysts. And the data model we did uh, to five angstroms included uh, platinum through four shells, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. Uh, we don't really see by excess platinum agglomeration during the high temperature reduction. I would say our experience is reduced platinum doesn't agglomerate significantly. You're still talking about clusters below one nanometer, below 10 angstroms for the most part. We, you'll see later we, we generate clusters up to 30 angstroms and we do that intentionally by scheming to, to watch the, how the shape and uh, geometry changes. So if I look more at the high temperature region, the, the points I'd like to make is uh, the platinum first neighbor coordination, it decreases as you go above 400 degrees C. There's no platinum two level. It's completely absent, as shown in the red. And the platinum oxidic bonding is actually increasing from 400 degrees C on. So these very important excess findings. So we're seeing cluster interaction with the support increasing. And actually, from this data, the cluster size may be decreasing, certainly not growing a lot by excess. And if we look at just the basics of how you build a structure, and you look at spherical, uh, spherical clusters and their average coordination, versus the cluster diameter. You can generate these curves, which I think many of you are familiar with. And of course, for hexagonal or flat graph type structures, like a 111 surface plane, is the average coordination number is much less for a given cluster diameter. So you're talking about a RAS in the simplest case versus a more spherical structure. And so when you look at that and model it, what we conclude is at the high temperature regime, 
we actually have single layer hexagonal clusters that are three to six angstroms. This is after high temperature reduction. These clusters may have anywhere from 10 to 20 atoms in them as analyzed by XS. And so they're flat. They're not spherical clusters where there's just a few atoms bonded to the surface. And if you uh, go a little further, I, I mentioned this. You can, this is maybe not the best uh, micrograph to show, but after we can, we can blow the clusters apart intentionally using this uh, powerful microscope and then count the atoms. And we do that as a way to, to, to know how many atoms are in the clusters. To, so we can count the exact number, like there's 26 atoms in this cluster, there's 28 atoms in that one. It's a powerful tool. So again, if you look at the stem image after the 700 degree reduction, you get a little bit different answer. You see clusters of nine angstroms on the order of that. And occasional, you, you can see isolated atoms as well. It's, so it's not consistent with the excess data. The excess data would say three to six angstrom type cluster size. Uh, our hypothesis is now that there's just a large amount of platinum oxide uh, support interaction, which is inducing disorder and making the excess interpretation difficult. So at 700 degrees redu reduced catalyst, STEM and XS do not agree, or, or they don't uh, they don't agree as strongly as they would at 250 degrees C or 400 degrees C. And this is somewhat difficult to interpret. You can see the stem image here. The interesting thing I wanted to go to is now, of course, we can count the atoms in a large number of clusters now on real catalyst, all the way down sub 10 angstrom. And we can steam catalysts, make the particles bigger. And one thing that's fairly clear to us is um, we're not seeing the and of course, if they were spherical, the number of atoms would follow this curve. They're tri or bi layer these curves. It's really a very flat structure of platinum that's highly reduced interacting, interacting with the support. And um, uh, we presented this at the last summer. It's agreement. It agrees with the x halves. And so, if I just take a step back, here's what our view would be: the platinum is completely reduced um, in this study when we go to high temperature and also under real react, uh, real process reacting conditions. You can do, of course, the real the propane dehydro or the high temperature reducing conditions in the excess cell. It's completely reduced platinum. Uh, both excess and stem are really showing that they're, they're flat rasp type structures. A significant amount, like 2.5 angstrom oxygen to platinum distance interaction and, and when you see this, normally people would, well, I would say often when you have this platinum atom oxide support interaction, uh, many people would say, well, then you have some partially positive charged platinum. Is that, is that platinum really reduced? Do you have a platinum metal atoms bonded to an aluminum oxide surface as individual atoms? It's, it's, it's a dilemma, actually, for me. I, I don't quite understand it. Um, so if you look at a more spherical type, we've done a lot of modeling with uh, J.J. Rare and Simon Bear have done, where we model clusters on a surface where there's just a few atoms interacting with the aluminum oxide atoms. And these interchange and they're fluxional in the picosecond time scale. But when we look at our, this is a stem image of 26 platinum atoms. They're very raft-like. They're not spherical. They're sitting flat on the aluminum surface with a lot of support interaction. And so this, I don't know if this bothers anyone in the audience, but it bothers me a lot as a catalyst chemist because I really expected more to see this type of structure, I guess, or that was a, always a structure we had in our head as you're designing catalysts, but now you find out, well, maybe that's not quite the case, or maybe it's uh, some blend of these two structures. So platinum function conclusions, I've covered most of them. At low temperature, it's fairly straightforward. I don't think there's much disagreement uh, about, um, internally or even among literature data. You lose the ligands, the platinum gets reduced, you have some single atoms, but you also start to get incipient clusters of four to six atoms. What happens when you go to high temperature is a totally different story. You, you don't really get uh, uh, 
growth of spherical or large clusters like you might see if you were studying 50 or 100 angstrom clusters that people study. And these smaller clusters, you really don't see that. They're more raft-type structures, similar to 111 platinum planes. Yet they're reduced. They behave like reduced catalysts. They can be alloyed with or form intermetallics with other metals. You can measure that. And so um, the inconsistently, an inconsistent data we see is just the particle size predicted by excess nearest neighbors and the stem. That's something we haven't completely figured out yet. And um, so that's the story on platinum clusters. We think it's very interesting. It's not necessarily what you'd expect. Modifiers, I really am not going to speak in detail. We've talked about that in the past. Other than to say, of course, no one's using monometallic platinum catalysts anywhere that I know of. Or it's very limited use, we say that, in platforming or dehydrogenation. So people use modifiers. We've been using modifiers for many decades. There's no question you form bimetallic, intermetallic structures. So the platinum is bonded to those metals. And what does that do? I'm showing a picture, I think this is from the first saute reference, where there's an intermetallic form. One thing that's pretty clear is that the olefin interaction on a modified platinum uh, say tin or germanium type structure is less than it is on a platinum only structure. And you get less consecutive dehydrogenation to coke when you have that modifier. Those are all consistent findings. You have weaker platinum diolefin bonds for platinum tin structures in, in our experience. And then the coke formation is unquestionably less when you have a platinum modified system. There are many excellent papers on this. I'm not going to go into any of our data in this system other than to say these conclusions up here. Whether it's site blocking or electronic interaction or a combination, is, there's some debate among people who know a lot more about it than I do. But what I would say is there's no question that you have weaker diolefin bonding, less coke formation. <clears throat> and so why, why do we care about any of this? Well, it's very important because when I, I was talking about those clusters as they're, as they're a static condition, right? You have an eight angstrom cluster, you have a six angstrom cluster, you have individual platinum out of it. But in the real system, remember, we're moving the catalyst, regenerating it continuously, moving between reduced and oxidized states. And so by catalyst design, you need a redispersible metal function that keeps its activity, selectivity with the modifier, is non-volatile and stable. You need to meet all those requirements. And by doing that, you know, as you, we move through generations, we can reduce the platinum inventory in these large reactors significantly and improve activity, actually. So it's important to control that chemistry. What's next in PDH? Uh, there's new generation technology that will be coming out from ULP. There are step change improvements. We can improve conversion, increase yield per pass, reduce utilities considerably, reduce capital, and we fast track the development. Uh, C4 processing improvements, they're driven more toward LPG crackers. And uh, we've also updated the C4 Oliflex. So there's big changes coming in PDH that will be uh, announced and commercialized shortly. Um, how, how am I for time? I, seven minutes. Oh, I'll quickly go through MTO. MTO, uh, gas to olefins technology, that's the other technology that's taking off worldwide. It's been around a long time. I, I always say we were ready for MTO in like 1988. I think we had 1,000 regenerations of SAPO 34 in 1988. But the market wasn't ready. Um, uh, these are big investments, large plants. We've worked with both INEOS and Total to develop what we call an advanced. And what that is is MTO combined with an uh, olefin cracking process. As you know, SAPL-34 allows linear molecules to diffuse out of the pore mouth to make ethylene, propylene, and higher olefins. You don't want those higher olefins, or most customers don't want the higher olefins, so you crack those back, like one butene, two butene, pentenes back to ethylene and propylene. If you do that, then you can get very high yields, light olefin carbon yields of 90% from MTL. And uh, uh, that's attractive to customers. It's a, a low methanol consumption per ton of olefin produced. If you look at economics, I won't take you through all this, uh, but 
natural gas-based MTO in the Middle East and coal-based MTO in China make a lot of sense. And that's why you've seen so many announcements. The Allian started up their MTO plant a few years ago. We've announced, I think, four licensees for MTO. There's solid economic drivers for doing that. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can look at coal, oil, uh, differential prices, and so on, and conclude this very easily. And you know, in our own technology, I think a big part of it was our collaboration with Total. That allowed us to make a demo plant uh, 10 tons per day, make enough olefin that we can make polymers, and, and for polymer producers, that's all important. And that was key. Um, we started a long time ago. Some, t some of these have long incubation times. I'll conclude. High crude oil prices disadvantage naphtha, so we're seeing a big change in the petrochemical market. Uh, shale cast production is driving down the price of natural gas liquids. I found out the other day there's enough hydrocarbons being burned in South Dakota, being flared to light up Chicago and Washington completely. So there's a large amount, and so for people, you know, all of us concerned about green chemistry, right there is an opportunity, right? So there's uh, <coughs> a lot of liquids available. And we're seeing demand even for Cyclar, which is LPG aromatization. That's something we did also with uh, BP. And I don't say we think it was dead. There were many fine studies done by Enrique on the chemistry of Cyclar. UOP did a lot of work on it. It's coming back because uh, there's only so many olefins you can make, and a lot of people want to make aromatics now from Cyclar. Uh, Dehydro and MTO continue to grow rapidly. I want to acknowledge um, all the UOP staff that did all the platinum cluster work, Department of Energy. We have excellent work at Argonne, collaborations with Soma, Kamalheri, and John, and also at the Beam Lines, at Brookhaven, Stanford, and we've had a long relationship with Oak Ridge in the um, original AC STEM development work. Uh, Steve Bradley was down there at Oak Ridge a lot, and they're just tremendous people to work with. So I want to uh, thank those collaborators. And I also want to thank the current uh, Olaflex team and all these, I can't name everybody at EOP, but these people all made a lot of contrib contributions to Olaflex and MTO. Uh, if you have any questions on MTO, Paul Barger, who did all the heavy lifting on our MTO, is sitting right there, he will answer those. And my daughter told me yesterday on vacation or two days ago that I should put a lot of stars next to Marine Bricker's name. <laughs> Since she does a lot more work, real work than I do. <laughs> so with that, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. The paper is open for discussion, so are there any questions in a few minutes? So uh, try to talk loud. You, you showed platinum oxygen bonding distance of about two and a half months. And lots of people in the field have said that's longer than a bonding distance. That the bonding distance is about 2.1, which ties to your question about oxidation state of platinum. Yeah, yeah. that's a very good point. I, the only way, the way I rationalize this data is it's fully <coughs> reduced clusters that are associated, have enough uh, connection to the surface <coughs> but aren't truly platinum oxygen bonds. Yeah, I think that's a good point. So you reduce the loading of platinum because of reducing the, the cluster size. What is the limit? Oh, by reducing platinum, can we make smaller clusters? Is uh, your question? No, no. Oh. What is the limit of how low you can have it, how small a cluster you can have and still have the same activity and selectivity? Oh, I, we don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I can't say the answer to that question either. But um, <laughs> I, I would say this. <laughs> I don't think that you need clusters for propane dehydrogenation. And it's not a structure of sensitive reaction. Or uh, another way to say it is I think very small clusters will do this reaction. I, that's a simple answer. Whether I could prove that to you right now or with more data, I think we'll, we might be able to. But... Yeah, so I think you could go down to almost single atom, double dimers. Oh, yeah, the question was how small, I think the question where he was going was how small can a cluster be and still do the chemistry? So if you reduce platinum loading a lot, for example, can you get down to single atom platinum and do this chemistry? And the answer is I think yes, 
Uh, you'll want to have the modifier atoms in there so it'll never be a single atom, but you can make, I think, pretty small clusters. Whether you can maintain them across the cycles. Yeah. But that was a very nice talk. Uh, how low is the acidity after you clean up the uh, gamma alumina? I thought the uh, gamma alumina you really cannot get rid of the acidity. Yeah, the aluminas we use in this technology or have been developed over many years, um, there's no acidity on our catalyst. Uh, At 600 degrees C, 650 degrees C, you won't be able to measure acidity in any probe reaction. And that's a study of many, many years by some of the people in the audience, uh, some of my co-workers at UOP. Measured by whatever... Uh, uh, you can put measure by probe reactions like as cracking. You yeah. can measure by probe reactions like acidity, um, probe molecules. Yeah. They, there's no acidity. I can tell you this because we can, there may be cases where you want to drive that modification to the very minimum. Yeah. And then if you go over the edge a little bit, you'll get tremendous poking very quickly. You'll know it. Oh. At 650 degrees C with propadiene and pro propylene. So I, I would, I always argue there's no acidity. We figured out how to eliminate all of them. Yeah. Sure. Could you please comment about the oxidative dehydro technologies that you said just based on the whole for which it would be obtained? Well, oxidative dehydro, yeah, we have a lot of patents on that. I worked a lot on that a long time ago when I was young, and uh, that can be done. Um, I, we presented a little bit on it like a year ago. So you, you can use, if you look at our patents, you can use uh, these kind of catalysts, and you can do what we would call oxidative reheat. You, the reactor design that you choose is very important, but the same catalyst that does dehydrogenation can burn hydrogen selectively. So how you choose to do that in a process, whether it be a fluid bed, a radial flow bed with two radial layers flowing, an inner heating bed, you, you could have a fixed bed of reheat catalyst, is a matter of process selection, but you can do oxidative reheat. We demonstrated a long time ago you could do oxidative reheat chemistry with this to advance the technology. Is, does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 I have a question about the uh, platinum molecization. Uh, in the catalytic converter industry, now they have an issue of PTO2 form and molecules off of the alumina, and you have a CCR. Do you have any issue when you have to use platinum catalyst? Uh, yeah, the question was, do, do we see any volatilization of platinum and do bimetallics play a role in preventing that? Well, we do not see volatilization of platinum under normal conditions. You could have an upset condition with very high chlorine levels or something that should never happen in a unit. It might cause that to happen. But under normal operation, there's no platinum volatilization at all. It's independent of the modifier, even without the modifier, because... Our regenerators are designed in a way that the temperature, the pill temperature, it does, just doesn't get as hot as a converter. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I saw in your talk you were trying to compare the results at 700 degree reduction for XF and STEM. So wouldn't you expect they won't match anywhere because of disruption and the average information from XF when compared to the local information from STEM. Yeah, I mean, we didn't expect it to match perfectly, I think. Uh, <laughs> but we, we were concerned a little bit about seeing nine angstrom clusters and XS predicting four angstrom clusters. That seemed like a big difference to us if you just count the atoms. And we can count the atoms in the STEM, so we know how many atoms are in that picture. And so that did concern us a little bit, so we're worried about disorder and due to the platinum-oxygen interaction. I, you know, something we're doing more work on to understand. But yes, I, I didn't. I don't think we expect it to be a perfect answer, but it was a little bit too much for our plate or for our taste. So we're continuing to look at it more. I think that I need to move on. I know there's been great, great level of discussion, so. Uh, okay. I encourage you to visit with them afterwards, and so let's meet. Thank you.